when someone signs up for your gym as a, as a member, there's a certain expectation. That's not the experience. That's meeting expectations. And that's gonna make someone happy, that's gonna make them you know, probably remain as a client, but it's not gonna turn anyone into an advocate. You know, when you go to uh, somewhere that has an amazing experience, um, D Disneyland, for example, like you buy your ticket and you've got certain expectations, but it's all the little things they do in between that really make the difference, right? It's the things you don't expect. Welcome to Barbell Business, I'm Mike Bletso. I'm here with Doug Larson and Marcus Gersey, and we have traveled to Las Vegas again. We were here for a bunch of Barbell Shrug shows Not earlier. Too long ago. Yeah, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it had been too long, it's gonna be back. Yeah, mm -hmm. can't stay out of Vegas too long. We're here at uh, CrossFit Max Effort. They've been really gracious in letting us come in, mm -hmm. record, and uh, we had- Thank you to Zach, by the way, yeah, for we had Zach always on letting the show. us come in and record videos. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, we have AJ Roberts with us today. And uh, AJ used to be the host of Barbell Business at one point. Mm -hmm. So he knows some stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You're most well known, I think. Well, what you're doing now is mostly coaching personal trainers and gym owners and helping them become better business owners and yeah. make more money. Make that transition. Yeah, additionally, uh, you're one of my favorite speakers of all time. When I go to business conferences and, and when you speak, I feel like it's the most impactful message that I that I get to sit through. Yeah. Oh. For sure. Uh, uh, testimonial, thank you. I'll quote that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll snip it out. Uh, you also used to instruct the CrossFit powerlifting courses. Yeah. Uh, your former powerlifter, world record holder at one point, correct? Yeah. Two times, yeah, right? Yeah, what, what, yeah. What was your spot? 1205. 1205. 910 bench, 815 deadlift. Yeah, yeah. That's so, a long time ago. Now that you're not there, you're, you're one of the very unique people that really has a, a very solid perspective on training and a very solid perspective on business. You, you know both sides of the house, which is a, a, a really important thing to know if you're going to be an entrepreneur in the fitness space. Mm -hmm. Some guys only know one or the other, and they end up struggling, you know, because they only know one side of the house. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, I know you're an expert marketer, so well, we're going to zoom out a little bit today, and I'll, I'd like to hear kind of your, your big, like, top three zoomed out marketing principles, yeah. uh, and then we're going to touch on a, a few other things as well. Yeah, you had, uh, when we were at breakfast this morning, you were talking about your kind of the three pillars within the business, and, and you know, we've got sales, we've got marketing, we've got experience piece, and the, the sales piece is something that I think a lot of gym owners really struggle with, and it's one of the key elements. Um, so I'm really excited to explore that with you, too. Yeah. Yeah, what are those three uh, pillars? Which one do you start with when you're working with somebody? Well, it really depends on where they're at already, right? So usually, one of the one of the greatest things is, is and, uh, and this is a lot of what I learned at Westside was we're always looking for your weakness, and you attack the weakness, and you turn your weakness into a strength. Um, the beautiful thing in business, of course, is, is that you can bring in other people to strengthen you. You just got to be aware of your weaknesses. And so typically we're looking for w w what is it that they're not doing well. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, most of the time, um, you know, uh, a successful uh, coach is lacking the sales and marketing. And when mm -hmm. I say success, someone who get results. They get results, but they just, they're not able to make the impact they want. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't have a full roster. Uh, they don't need any other trainers. They're basically self-employed. Um, and it's because they just, the, the, the marketing and sales, when they start trying to learn it and see it, they, they just see it as manipulative or, you know, persuasive. And they're like, you know, I just want my results to speak for themselves. But, you know, if no one sees it, if no one is aware of it, you know, it's very hard to build that word of mouth marketing, uh, especially with the amount of competition. The amount of competition is, is a big factor in it as well. So you can be really, really good at what you do, but if you are across the other side of town, then there's chances of people seeing it as slim to none. So usually we're looking at the, the marketing or the sales, but 
it, it, everything builds off of each other, right? You gotta have the results first. If you're not a good coach, not a good trainer, you can't really build out sales and marketing if you don't get results. And so it's kinda, it's, it's a little bit chicken and an egg. Do, right? do you think but, a lot of people are afraid to do sales and marketing because they actually don't feel good about the experience they're providing and, and the results? I think that, I think a lot of people are overwhelmed, right? It's a lot of people, like when you look at your day, if you're in the trenches on a daily basis, if you're, if you're actually providing the service, so you're there, you're meeting with members, you're doing uh, you know, consultations, you're programming, you're, you know, you're, you're cleaning and doing, doing all of the different things, and you actually look at how much time do you have, you have very little. You have very little time because if we, if we look at just the sales component, well, we gotta, we gotta market, then we gotta field, we gotta have conversations, we gotta get people in, we gotta sit with them, we gotta, and then we gotta convert. So there's a whole process that has to go into that. Well, how do you have time to do that if you're working 10 hours a day, you know? Yeah, okay, you've got the night, but you're not gonna be calling prospects up at nine o'clock at night to schedule an appointment. So there's a lot that goes into it. I think most people are overwhelmed. They don't know where to start, so they don't start at all because they're worried they're gonna waste money or they're gonna, you know, it's not gonna work. Um, and so they just do what they, they default back to comfort, which is coaching. And so they'll coach and, you know, they'll, in the beginning, they might get referrals. And then that person's like, I don't really have anyone else. You know, most people don't have a massive list of people they can send your way. And so, you know, then you're like, you're serving those clients, they're getting the results, but there's not any, uh, you know, new people coming through the door. And one of the things that I've seen, unfortunately, is that people like new, and people like community. And so if you remain small and you've been in business for a while, you become kind of second hat, you know, something new opens up that's like people are attracted to it, plus there seems like there's more people and people inevitably believe if there's a line or, you know, it must be good. That's how a lot of these new restaurants set out, right? They have those big opening nights, they pack the lines, everyone goes, oh, it must be really good. Whether it's good or not, people just presume that. So that's where I think that for a lot of people, they're so in the trenches that if they looked at, well, how much time do I actually spend on building the business? It's slim to none. And if you look at it, like, in order to be successful in business, it's literally whoever can make the most offers. And if you're not making an offer on a daily basis for someone to, you know, you know, come in and be a new member, then then you're going to struggle. And that's then they try to play catch up. And uh, usually, maybe they'll do a little bit of marketing. They'll get a, they'll get a little bump, but then they break to like do that, and and then they're constantly and they never actually move over. You know, a couple of years they remain with the same amount of members because they never actually just go all in over here. And I yeah. think that that's the hardest thing is the transition, right? It's the transition and going in order for me. Most people, when they're ready to stop coaching, what they do is they want to check out. And they say, I have this build business, I'm gonna let someone else coach, and I'm just gonna now relax, I'm gonna play with my dog, I'm gonna enjoy my life. And they don't realize that they actually have to become a professional at the next thing, which is being a business owner. So I think that, that that's where a lot of it comes in. So, you know, they don't have those three pillars, they check out, the other coach is doing all the work, the other coach says, I'm gonna go do my own thing, the members leave, and all of a sudden we have that dip again, and people, I think that's kind of where we're in this, obviously it's been a while, um, you know, since we, we've done a business show, but from, you know, uh, a year or so ago, I think we're seeing that more now, where lots of coaches are leaving, opening up their own places locally. Oh, yeah. So now, now not only do we have lack of awareness, we also have more competition, so when someone does become aware, they have so many options that if you're not really knocking it out of the park, you're kind of obsolete and we're seeing this across industries. So yeah. it's not just fitness, we can see it with the retail stores, you know, and uh, if you don't have, you don't have something unique, you don't have something different, you don't have an experience that goes beyond just the training session, then you're going to lose out. So yeah, I, I think um, when I think about sales, marketing and experience, for creating a really good experience is probably what, where people are most comfortable. Like, okay, I, I want to do that. That seems like the thing that I'm attracted to most. Marketing seems confusing. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, marketing's confusing. I tried Facebook ads once. It didn't work. Facebook ads don't work. Obviously confused about that. And then sales it presents like this, this discomfort. And so I think that people are much more likely to want to concentrate on experience. Mm -hmm. They may be a little confused there too on how to do that. Marketing is very confusing, but then like, yeah, like I said before, the sales is just uncomfortable. Which, so from that perspective, what can people do about the discomfort of sales specifically? Yeah. Because that's, people avoid that. Yeah. 
So I think that the, the comes down to a lot of our perception. When you think of sales, you think of uh, what a car salesman or when you walk in a store, someone coming up to you like, oh, do you need help? And what they don't realize is, and I, I, I uh, have a process called pres prescription selling system. And it's called prescription because I want to look at it like you're the doctor. Uh, you're the doctor of fitness, you understand what's needed. That client has symptoms and they're going to tell you what their problem is and then you've got to prescribe the solution to that. And I look at it, it's, it's, it's literally sales is just a communication process of determining what, it, what is it you want and then actually showing them the path and then allowing them to make the decision, are you committed to that path or not? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the difference. When people think of sales, they think of, I got to show them all the benefits of the gym. I got to explain to them like what we do here, why it's different. And it's never focused on the actual client. You know, it's never focused on well, what, what's going on with you. How is that affecting you? Okay, like what would life be like if, if that was fixed? How do you see that future? And you go, here's the, here's the pain they're in, you know, and, and here's the future and then here's the path, and then boom, you're ready to move them. You know, Because once they can see that, they're like, okay. Then it's simply a question of, can they truly afford it? Which usually is really, are they truly committed? Because if, if, if it's a big enough thing for them to fix, they'll usually find the money no matter what. Yeah. If there's an excuse, it just simply means they're not ready for what it is you provide. And you know, we've talked before, there's so many different levels in the fitness industry that meet people at different phases that one of the hardest things I think as a coach or a business owner in the fitness industry is to realize that you can't help everyone. Like you cannot, like you, if, you're, if you say my gym's for everyone, you've lost. Because the reality is, is that you might be able to help everyone, but not everyone wants to be together. Like humans separate themselves based on, you know, their perception of where they're at. And someone who's an advanced fitness person is not gonna wanna work out with a complete beginner and they'll segregate themselves. And so if you have a facility that has a certain style, and then you have a client who say wants personal training, they're attracted to personal training, they're not gonna come join a box because they don't wanna be in a large group. They wanna have a personal intimate experience. That's what they've determined for them. Now we could try to convince them that this experience is for them, or we can simply just say, you know what? There's another person and here's their number, here's there and refer out. And I think that that is something that when it comes to sales, if you know specifically who your ideal client is, and we'll talk about that when we talk to marketing on how to figure that out, but if you know exactly who your ideal client is, and sometimes it's a, you'll have multiple ideal clients, but if you understand that and someone comes in who doesn't fit that mold, you know that not only do they have the option to turn you down, but you should have the option to turn them down. That person in front of you is like, it's people see the dollars. But what they don't realize is if, if I've got two elite athletes and a beginner, and I've got to, as a coach, spend all my time with you to coach you, and these two get ignored, well, these two aren't going to want to be my clients, but these might have been my dream clients. But I'm having to invest all my time into you as, as a beginner, because that's what you need, that's what's there. And I think that that's where a lot of people don't understand is that, or I always say, if you have to convince someone to become a client, you're probably going to have to convince them to show up to workouts, convince them to follow your advice, convince them yep. to, to do all the extra stuff. And that's not a position that you want to be in because you can't motivate someone else 24-7. It's and it's a slippery another. slope because yeah. what happens oftentimes is that people will kind of force it forward. Like they'll try to convince people and they'll start to build a member base of people who aren't actually their ideal fit. And all of a sudden now you've got this like this issue where you're like, man, only like 70% of my members are actually showing up, 30% are kind of signed up and they're, you have this like super high risk business model and not to mention you're probably not jiving with people, there's not a great sense of community because they're not really meant to be together, yeah. right? And so even though you may have gotten some numbers on the board, you're actually now in a much worse position, a much more precarious position because now you've had, you maybe expanded or you hired some people and you've, you've ra you had to ratchet the business up to match it. Yeah. It's not just you maybe doing it anymore, but now you've got this risky model where it's like, oh shit, I don't want to tell people to leave because that's like money and that's like the only check I'm getting. So how do you replace someone? What do you say to someone who's kind of built a business like that and they need to transition from the like, oh shit, this isn't the right model and then get it healthy, get it balanced. That's a, that's a great question and what's interesting is I find that most people who feel like they're burnt out on their business is because they built a business that wasn't like 
suited to who they are and who they would hang out with. And so they don't actually want to be around the business. The passion isn't there. Um, and so they get to that point where they're like, like, it's like, okay, what do you feel cool to do? What is it that you're passionate about? When you close your eyes and you think about the future, what do you see? And they'll be like, I see myself working with guys and like, we're, you know, we're good, grueling workouts, breakthroughs. And I'm like, okay, and who are your clients? They're like, I got sucker moms. And you're like, okay. Right. And fundamentally, um, and this, in the sales process, usually when someone says no, it's because at, 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 the, at the survival level, they don't trust you, right? There's a sign they don't trust you. Well, imagine a woman with three kids, married, telling me about all of her problems, and I'm going, I totally understand you. She's looking at me being like, what the fuck do you know about being a mother with three kids and having a husband that doesn't look at you, stays at the office late? She might never say that to me, but subconsciously, that's the conversation. So. When someone's in that position, usually they don't like their business and it's actually they're really, really struggling. So it's an easy switch once they understand what that ideal client looks like. And typically, you know, um, if you're not familiar with Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, uh, you should, that's something all business owners should familiarize themselves on. Uh, there's a great book, Story Wars, that kind of breaks it down for marketing purposes. And then there's a great documentary called Finding Joe that kind of does it on, about life. But essentially, if you look at your life and the journey that you've take, taken mm -hmm. along that path, the lessons that you've learned, these, these are your clients. It's you five years ago, 10 years ago. It, or if you've been in the business long enough, it may not be your personal story, but what you'll see is like I've got four clients and this is their story. And they're all, these are my dream clients and oh, they have all these traits that are the same. Before they started working with me, they were, they, life was like this. They knew they needed to make a change. I showed up as the mentor. These are the struggles, trials and tribulations we've gone through, the lessons that they've learned in terms of, you know, okay, like I need to eat healthy, but if I go to a restaurant, I fuck up. Okay, I can't go to restaurants, so I have to change what restaurants I go to. And so then you get this, you get this journey of that ideal client, and then all of a sudden now you can connect to the ideal client because you can speak the language that they understand because you're talking to yourself or to your previous clients at that point where they're struggling. So all the things you're saying, just they go, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Mm -hmm. That's when sales becomes effortless. That's right. When someone walks in and goes, this is, these are my people, this is my place. Um, I have a friend, Mark Fisher, you guys have to get him on the show, he, he's out in New York, but the easiest way to explain it is his gym is like a Burning Man. Right, and they dress up as unicorns, and they use you know all sorts of inappropriate language. But it's the the people who go there are Broadway stars, so they're theatrical. They're like you know, and so it's their place. Not everyone's going to be able to go there. I have a client; he owns a gym called Copper Moose, and they this slew of in, uh, insults at each other and sexual innuendos and all of this stuff. The community is incredible, but if you walk in there and you have a, you're sensitive to feminism or like any of these different things, like you're gonna be offended, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it's polarizing, and I think that so many people are scared to be polarizing, but when you can have the confidence to do that, obviously you can't just say, I'm no longer gonna work with all these people, if they have contracts and things like that, but you can begin to shift your focus, and so you can flip the 80-20 model, you know, where instead of 20% of the people being your ideal clients, now it's 80%, mm -hmm. and you're always gonna have those people that cycle through, and maybe they fit, maybe they don't, but you mentioned community there, and that's, that's the real thing. Are people finding their tribe? Is the gym the third home? You know, Starbucks talks about being the third home. The, if you're in the gym business, the gym should be the third home. They should, they should want to come early and they should want to leave late. They should, it should become their lifestyle. Well, they're not going to do that if the people they're training with are not people they would drink beers with, party with, do those kind of things. And so everyone's different. Everyone has a unique thing. Not everyone's attracted to the Burning Man style or, you know, the insults and that kind of stuff, but people are. Yeah. And so it gives you the ability to have that space and really be targeted and that's what people look for. They look for like, where's everyone else who's weird like me? And because of the age we live in, you realize, oh, I'm not alone. And if you can get someone to feel like I'm not alone in this process, there's all these people who are just like me, struggling like me, you constantly get in case studies and stories, someone who had the breakthrough and that, that dude's just like me, I can do that too, or that woman. Oh, I'm going through the same struggles. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, your marketing kind of takes over itself because all you're doing is telling the stories of your members, yeah. and it's bringing more members. And like attracts like. When you don't have that, and you you know you've got a you know 20 year old as a case study, but you've got a 40 year old seeing it. They're not attracted. <coughs> they're really. looking at that person. They say, "That's not me." Great, great sales and marketing is just having a, a very specific, relevant conversation with someone where they're like, "Oh, yeah, that's me," right? So. 
how can you ever expect to have an effective sales system or marketing system <coughs> if you haven't first identified who it is that you not only like want to, but can serve, right? Those yeah. are the two things. It's like, I really like these people, but I can't necessarily, that's not my jam, I don't have the skill set for that. That's probably not a fit. You have to see where those things intersect. That's your jam. I love hanging out with these people. These are the people I want to go have beers with and whatnot. These are all the people also that what I do freaking crushes their goals, right? That's your lane. And then you have to center, that's the center point of all of your sales and marketing efforts from your stories, your examples, the imagery that you use, all this stuff then starts to come out. And when you start with that, most gym owners have never even thought of the concept or, or actually gone through the exercise and created their brand heroes. And they think like, oh, well, I'm supposed to create like five, six, 10, nope. Do one male, one female just to start. It can become more elaborate over time. Just start simple, but go through your member base. If you're already in business, you can look at your member base and say, okay, who are like my ideal? Who's my very best client? The one who shows up all the time, gets great results. I freaking love them. Someone new comes in, they go and introduce themselves. I host an event. They're there early asking what they can do to help. They're sending friends and family like, I want to clone that guy. Perfect. Everything is now a conversation with that guy. And it, it starts to become really easy. And now because your marketing is talking to that guy, it's gonna resonate with that guy. And so when he comes in, you're like, yeah. He's like, yeah. He was like, come on in. It's really easy now if you can just connect with them on a personal basis. And all of a sudden this big mysterious like sales and marketing challenge doesn't become so mysterious. Now it's a matter of like, oh, I figured out the like dominoes, I've set them all up. Now it's just knock them down and control how much or how little do I want. Mm. Absolutely. You know, I think the biggest mistake people make when they're doing that is, you know, I mentioned looking at your life and seeing what your experience is and, and mentioned or looking at the people you've worked with. Mm. I think a lot of people when they're doing that, trying to come up with their hero, what they do is they say, oh, you, uh, like I want to work with a guy like Doug, a guy who does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a guy who's very focused on learning, so I'm going to work with Doug. And, and, but they don't have no experience with a guy like Doug. But they see Doug and they go, Doug's a great guy. He's like, I, I and they, they see the person they want to coach versus the person they should coach. And then so they're looking ahead at like, like Doug's this guy, he's been in the industry forever, da, da, da. That's who I want as my member. And it's like, but Doug's ahead of me as a coach. I, how can I coach Doug? Right? But that's, and so they make that mistake because they, 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 uh, Think about their ideal client as in the person they wish to work with, not the person they have the experience of working with. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the biggest mistake they can make when they come to the ideal client. I just wanted to bring that up because I think that a lot of people do look at that. I want to coach CrossFit Games athletes. Sounds and they've awesome. never sent anyone to the games. Right. Oh, we got a problem. Yep. Right? I think it's equally beneficial to not just have your, your avatar for the person that you want, but also, also to very accurately point out who you don't want. Mm -hmm. Like you, on, your, yep. on your website or wherever, in all of your marketing materials, to say like, this is who we want. Want. This is who we are, and we don't want all these other people. That way, people that that see, like, I'm a, I'm a match for this avatar, and I actually don't really like all these other people. Uh, CrossFit did it very well with, with bodybuilders in the beginning. Like, we're anti bodybuilders. We're CrossFitters. We're different than them. We're not like them, and it created that divide, which was really important. And it, it is polarizing, but at the same time, even though you might get a lot of people that don't like you, you get a lot, a lot of people that love you. And so, by getting a lot of people that love you, you don't need. 10,000 people, you only need 150 people. And there's enough people like in, in any small town to like get 150 people that are polarized enough to come do CrossFit out of very niche gym. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great point. You've got to have the nuts to say like, these are not who I work with. Yeah. Like I don't, if you've never had a gym membership before, probably not going to work with you. People, you know, don't want, people don't want the conflict. Yeah. They don't want to say, I don't like those people because they don't want those people to be mad at them. Yeah. Even though it, it works very well from a marketing perspective. Yeah, we were and talking about a company. I won't mention the names because this might get, like, I don't know legally <laughs> anymore with this stuff. But, you know, their, 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 ta their basic message is, is like, we're not a gym because they want to attract the people who have never been to a gym before, right? And they want to give them a safe zone. And so they have all these rules set up where guys like us would be like, this is ridiculous. And we do, we look at it, we kind of look at that and go, what the hell? But the people they attract, it's perfect for. They want to be able to eat pizza in the gym because that's the level they're at. So they're perfect for that level. And I think that, that that's, you know, that's why they're one of the biggest you know, franchises out there is because they're willing to do that. We don't want bodybuilders. We don't want powerlifters. We don't want CrossFit. We don't want you know. We don't want anyone that, that actually works out. We don't want <laughs> anyone we don't want to be a and treadmills. Little, little bit fitter, a little bit more yeah. healthy without without being intimidated, yeah. without having like all of your insecurities show up because one. other people are way beyond you and you never look like them. Yeah, it's like we might have an organic section, right? It's like we know most of our clients probably are going to go for the cheapest option, but we'll have the organic section for those that want to dip their toes in. 
it's it's just the, the industry is like that, and I think you nailed it. You've got to know, like, hey, no, I don't, I can't help you. Sorry, you've got to go through all of this first. And I think that that's very important to understand. And then the hard part there is actually when someone comes in and they are on your we're not for you list, especially if you're struggling and, and your cash flow is low, and you need the money to tell that person no because you know it's going to affect your culture. Because mm -hmm. if, if you said, hey, it's for these people but not these other people, and then you let the other people in, all the people that you signed up before that yep. are a part of your culture are like, what the fuck's going on? Like, why, why is that guy in here? Why did you make an exception? Like, you, have, you don't actually believe what you believe. Like, you're mm -hmm. just you're just saying that. You're just a sales guy. You'll say anything. And now, like, trust is is, is eroded. Uh, the culture breaks down, and you're just not you're not as strong uh, of a gym as you could be otherwise. No, absolutely. And, yeah, and we, people aren't going to stay. We really dug confidence. In a, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, we really dug into sales and marketing. We got it started in marketing. What I really like about the conversation is. Uh, we wanted to go to the sales marketing experience, and then we ended up just basically talking about branding first, which was really, which is really, really cool. Because building your sales and marketing without having the branding first is just like there's no foundation. Yeah. So uh, when we get into the second part, I want to wrap up the marketing conversation going into the full experience mm -hmm. part. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jeff Stoffel. I'm the owner of Centripetal CrossFit in Erie, Colorado. I was in the classic startup phase. I was coaching 32 classes a week of our 35. So I was there six days a week doing basically all of the coaching in between classes, answering emails, running through billing, trying to strap together marketing and just whatever it popped into my head. We created a space that is the best part of everybody's day. They know it and uh, they know as long as they get to the gym, their day is gonna be better, and that's very clear. So membership grew because of that fact, um, but wasn't growing um, because of good business process or a good marketing system or any of those things. Just kinda stuck at this 60 member mark um, and thinking, you know, how, how do we do more? I need to be able to hire somebody to go get the people to pay for that person and, and felt stuck uh, where I was at, didn't really know where to go. The first call that I had with Angelo ever, free intro call, hey, I'm struggling, we've met, I liked your intensity, and if you guys haven't met Angelo, uh, you never have to wonder what he's thinking, he'll tell you, you don't have to read between the lines. Within two weeks, I started to basically just because I've bought in to working with somebody, really take the advice and take it to the next level. So I'd say within two weeks, had a few major breakthroughs, doing silly stuff that we all know we should do, uh, but typically don't have the balls to do it on our own without a push. And so that was increase my prices um, and start contracts. I am coaching fewer classes, so I'm down to about 20 classes a week and that's a, a slow process to develop coaches that do a job uh, I'm proud of. Memberships increased, so we were at 60 when I started with Angelo. Gosh, it's been three months now, and we're up to uh, 75, so a very significant increase. The biggest effect on the business has been developing as a leader, and it's happened very quickly. Rather than being stuck thinking about an idea and the analysis paralysis, thinking through too many steps before getting started. I have taken good ideas and gotten them started and fine-tuned them as we went, which is a much better solution on the implementation for me. I would look at um, you know, yourself first and ask the question, do you think other people have learned the, the solution and the lesson that you're currently struggling with? If you think that this has been solved before and in the CrossFit space, you're not doing this the first time, somebody else has. Uh, I, I would definitely dive into it. If you're not sure if you can afford it, definitely do it. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but you're investing in yourself. That investment is never gonna go away. You're improving as a leader uh, and probably a person if you're running things right when you get a coach and you're buying into what you're selling. If you are an entrepreneur, you own a gym and you don't have a coach, you are asking other people to do something that you aren't willing to do yourself, would be my opinion. So I would definitely encourage you to at least have a phone call 
um, but come to them with what are your biggest struggles and see if they've got some ideas. Uh, this group does not mind, I think, adding some value for you to prove they're worth it. Definitely, uh, Angela's been worth it for me. And we're back with AJ Roberts. Talked about sales, a little bit of marketing in the first half, and um, I want to wrap up a little bit of the marketing conversation and get into uh, providing that that stellar customer experience. Yeah, I mean, the really without customer experience, you can't have the marketing, right? And I think that that's the biggest thing. But one of the things that people need to understand is that when someone signs up for your gym as a, as a member, there's a certain expectation. That's not the experience. That's meeting expectations. And that's gonna make someone happy, that's gonna make them you know, probably remain as a client, but it's not gonna turn anyone into an advocate. You know, when you go to uh, somewhere that has an amazing experience, um, D Disneyland for example, like you buy your ticket and you've got certain expectations, but it's all the little things they do in between that really make the difference, right? It's the things you don't expect. And when you're talking about experience and you're looking at it from your culture to your you know, core values to all these different things that, that are essential to building the community, you've also got to look at how do we go above and beyond for each and every one of our members? You know, and do we know the names of our members? Do we know the names of their family, like their wives, their children? Do we know when their birthday is? Do we send them you know, surprise gifts? Do we, we, we empower them with knowledge beyond what we're doing in the class? You know, and uh, we've talked about it before. You know, about, uh, I'm, I'm sure if you haven't seen uh, the show, you're familiar with like autoresponders. Like, like as a gym owner, you can educate your members not in the gym on things like the psychology of like relationship with food and the connection to the body and you can really be their resource and the experience side of it really comes down to saying okay like this person just assuming every single member has a very basic level knowledge can we not only train them but can we educate them can we empower them and can we actually transform their entire life even though we only see them for one hour and I think that that's the hard thing for people to understand. When they, when they come to a gym for one hour, that one hour is probably the least important part about the experience with the gym. Because they're coming anyway. You know, well, that, it's to give me. That and the guy down the street is offering that same exact experience. Exactly. Okay. All right, we, we do a warm up, we do the lifts, and then we do a, a cool down, and then we're done. Yeah. Everyone's offering that. Well, I think that's what people think about when they think about the client experience. It's like, okay, what is class from the start of class when you start warming up to the end of class when you say break and you go about your, your merry way? Like, that's not the full experience. That's the class experience. Yeah. But the, the experience is anytime someone's interacting with your business, whether they're sitting at home and looking at your website or whether they're, like, in the parking lot and they're walking up to the front door, whether they just walked inside or whether they're in the bathroom. Like, it's all a part of the experience and how, you're, how they perceive your business and your brand and how, how much they're going to want to just hang out at the gym and like just enjoy being there like it's not just the class there's so many other things to think about and so sales and marketing you have to design that experience with as, with as much intent as you design your classes yeah i think that you, you, you when you mentioned about the the design of experience and i think that that's you're right most people think of experience okay over this hour what can we cram into it but the reality is, and this is why actually CrossFit, I think, had such a big rush, why Spartan has such a big rush in terms of growth, is because the organization kind of tapped into some of this, these principles, you know, the party culture and to celebrate and things like that. But as time's gone on, a lot of that's been lost because things have gotten so big that, you know, if you've got 300 members, it's difficult to know everybody's name as a coach. You know, it's difficult to get everybody together to, to do community potlucks and events like that. So you have to do a lot of stuff. Um, and what's interesting is that people don't think of all of the basic things they could do to bring people together. And um, when we look at human psychology, which is really what we're in the business of, right? The reality is no matter what we think, the only business we're in is happiness. Right? Mm -hmm. It's that. So it's, it's like someone's not happy, they want to be happy, this is the path they believe going to get there, and we're, we're literally the vehicle that they're going to you know, ride on. When we look at that, it's like, okay, one of the biggest things for happiness is community, is being around people and serving, serving the community. So you don't even have to do things for the gym. You can create stuff where the gym goes and does stuff for other people and serves the outside community and really becomes you know, a part of everything. But that tribal coach, culture, that's what allows the business to flourish. And I've got clients who 
very high price stuff. Um, and so not everybody can afford to stay on long term. But they've created options where they can be alumni or they can be they can remain in the community for a much smaller piece. And they do. They work out you know somewhere else or they work out on their own or they get online programming and they you know can train as just as a, in the gym. But they've created this experience where the person's like, okay, like I can't afford four times a week personal training, but I don't want to leave this community. And when you're in that position, that's the real business. The service that you provide is irrelevant because you can transition, you can change, you can you know, shift whatever you feel like, but if you've got that core, core tribe, you right. know, um, yeah. then they'll follow you anywhere. Yeah, our, our friend Logan that runs Deuce Gym uh, in Venice, he has signs all over his gym that say you don't have to work out to kick it. Right, and that's like, that, that says so much. It's, it's, a, it's a small little sign on the wall, but like it, it means a lot that, that you don't have to like go there to work out. It's not just about health and fitness. Like that's a big part of it for sure, but like the community there is strong, the culture is strong. Like when he's selling a membership, he's selling fun, he's selling community, he's selling human connection, he's selling a social life, and he's not just selling health and fitness. That, that becomes a lot easier of a, of a sales pitch, so to speak, because you're selling someone on, hey, we just have a good fucking time here. Like, how do you put out a, with us. How do you put a price on that, right? When, you, when you're selling someone an hour, multiple times a week, or anything, it's very easy to do numbers, right? Oh, I'm gonna charge 100 bucks a month, 300 bucks a month, 1,000 a month. Someone goes, oh, I get four workout sessions. When you sell that whole package, you can't say, well, I'm paying this much for the workout and this much for the community and this much for the accountability and this much for the, for the culture. Like, it's just, this is what it is and this is what you get. Yeah. And people go, holy crap. And, it, and, it, and, and it's a, in terms of, again, go back to the, the this is the, on the logic level, when the brain sees that, the price doesn't seem expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's why you've got, uh, you know, like that gym we were talking about earlier in New York, Gwyneth Paltrow's new gym with her partner, 900 bucks a month. The article was really bad about explaining what to do, but basically what it sounded like is every single member has a personal trainer and they get, uh, they, uh, they, sorry, they have a personal workout plan and when they go to the gym, there's personal trainers available nonstop for them to interact with. Mm. It's very high end, the, the gym basically looks like an Apple store, it's like white, it's clean, uh, and, and people were like, why would anyone pay 900 bucks a month? Well, that's not, number one, that's not the most expensive people that people are paying. People are paying way more we, for we one on one. That. So but the the other thing is 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 it's what's important to them. We didn't call it a gym membership. Yeah, it's it's, no, a, no, it's, it's distinction. You know, people are paying that much money, but right. where I imagine the article screwed up is it's using the word gym membership yeah. and most people's impression of what a gym membership is the first gym membership they ever had. It's like oh the first time I had a gym membership it was thirty five bucks. So I have Comparison. an impression that's what a gym right. membership is. And mm -hmm. so you actually have to, if you're talking to somebody and you're using certain terminology, you have to understand what you think you're yeah. meaning and what they think you mean yeah. are completely different things. And that's why I've encouraged a lot of people to stay away from gym membership and yeah. let people know that they're actually selling them coaching, right. which is a value. Most people have never bought coaching. So the first time coaching. that they're gonna buy coaching is with you, so you get to set the standard there. Coaching, accountability, you know, experience, education, knowledge, like all of these things mm -hmm. play in. Um, and, and, and when you think about it, um, you, you mentioned the comparison there, right? And that's what really, with, with pricing, that's what people are doing, they're anchoring it to prices that they're aware of. And so, so the easiest thing is you think of like a book, you know, a real book, it's, I mean, you, you can get a book for a hundred bucks, you know, but usually they're something special with it. Most books are around 20, 30 bucks. But you create an ebook and, and, and package it as modules versus chapters, and all of a sudden you've got people charging 500 bucks for that kind of stuff, right? And so when, same, with, same with what you're offering with your gym membership, if it looks like everything else on the surface, people ju judge a book by its cover. So they're gonna walk in, they're gonna be, this looks like a, a CrossFit gym, and I've walked in a dozen of them. This one's 400 a month, that one's 200 a month. I'm gonna go for 200 a month. But they don't have any experience. They don't understand the difference. And so that's where it's so important that when they walk in, they see a difference, right? And that's not necessarily the layout. It's the professionalism, it's the, it's the way they're greeted, it's maybe yeah. uniforms, it's, yeah. it's everything. Right. And it's why someone, when we look at cars, you know, you can get a car for f five grand, brand new, you know, like a cheap car that gets you from A to B, it works. Fiat. Yeah. yeah, Fiat. I rented one of those. Yeah, I don't think four of us would fit it. <laughs> Never again. No. Never again. But, or you could go buy a Bugatti for 1.5 million, those, yeah. right? And, and, and if you had the money, you'd be like, oh, I'll, I'll buy that, why? 
because it's it's the entire car, the look of the car, the experience of the speed, the brand. It, it changes. But what at the end of the day, we've got speed limits, and you can only go from point A to point B at a certain pace, right? That's it. Yeah. There's no break in that. So when you look at it, like you're offering fitness. And in, for most gym owners, it's literally they're just offering a workout. That's what they're offering is a workout. But how that workout is packaged, positioned, priced, and promoted, that's the difference. 100%. The, the people that I know that are in really good shape, they don't just go work out because they're supposed to go work out. They work out because they think it's really fun. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's a form of entertainment for them. And you look at how educators get paid versus entertainers get paid, it's not even the same ballpark. Educators are making you know 30 to 60 grand a year, maybe 100 if you're like super high end. Entertainers are making millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So if you can package your, your membership from the, the frame or the context of like, this isn't just a workout, this is like what you're here to do for fun. This is, this is your entertainment. You're selling something completely different. And then charging you know 200 bucks for entertainment per month is, a, is phenomenally cheap. Like we paid for, we paid more for that for sushi last night. Like yeah. it's, it's like it's, we're in Vegas and everything's expensive. But uh, you know, nine bucks a month for a gym membership sounds like something you should. So you, you know, it's a no-brainer. But uh, two hundred dollars a month for someone that doesn't see training as something that's fun sounds like phenomenally expensive. So you you got to frame it that it's fun, it's entertaining, and then charging a lot for it is so much easier. And you mentioned there, it depends on where, what someone, what their income level is, what their expectations are. Nine bucks a month for someone, that, that, that might be tough. 200 bucks a month for someone might be tough. On the other side, it might just be, you know, and at the big box gyms, a lot of them survive because that nine bucks a month is not missed by anyone. But 200 bucks a month they miss, so it's harder to survive in that middle range. And then on the high end, you know, as someone who's paying the 900 bucks a month, we're going, like a lot of people are going from, the, they're going, that's expensive. But to that client that goes there, what if they make a million relative. a year? Yeah. 900 a month is, is, is and just like the $9 membership. So there's a position for everyone. And I think what the, the biggest thing to understand is you got to decide where you want to play. And a lot of that's going to be based on your experience because if you don't have the experience, you're not going to have the confidence. And if you don't have the confidence, you're not going to have the commitment or the courage to really push through and like get the capabilities to, to expand. But for, 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 for a lot of people, the problem is, is they're scared just to admit, like, hey, this is my level. This is where I'm at. This is what I can do. And society convinces them, hey, you should be doing more. You should be you know, ahead and ahead. And I, I, I just wish that so many people would realize that where they're at, because that's where they're supposed to be, and, the, and, and, and they're not missing their calling, or there's nothing outside of them that's supposed to happen. Maybe they're already where they're supposed to be, and that's if they just focus on amplifying that. Mm -hmm. Every, all of those questions would go away because I think all the time we're searching outside versus like, hey, maybe we have this because this is what we're supposed to have and we don't need to go look in a different direction. And I think that that's the hardest thing for a lot of people to accept is like, all right, I'm supposed to be like struggling right now. Well, that's it's a whole, part of the growth. And that's a whole nother like conversation yeah. in, in, our, in our marketplace. Like there's this idea of like what a successful gym is. Like, oh, you've got to have 300, 400 members or five locations or it's like more is better. And it's just like this whole perception of what success looks like. And people are like, well, I guess this, and they'll tell you like, this is what I want. But then you ask them like, well, what do you want your day to day to look, look like? Well, I want to know everyone's name. I want to have personal relationships. I really want to make an impact on people's lives. And I'm like, then that's not your model. This is your model. Yeah, but then what about this? It doesn't matter. Then let's figure out how to make that model work for your goals, your day-to-day -day life, and you have to then make sure that the business model actually suits that rather than putting the square peg in the round hole being like, this doesn't work, the people aren't lining up, the prices don't line up, I can't afford to pay for anything. It's because it's all just mishmashed based on what they saw other people doing. They're like, well, he's successful, he's got three gems, I'm gonna do his onboarding system, and I'm gonna do his sales system, or I'm gonna market like she does. It doesn't apply, it wasn't around you. So it's so important to first identify who are you, what do you want this thing to look like for yourself, and then say, okay, based on that, now what do I want the numbers to look like to support my life? How, who is the person I want to and can serve best? So you're getting all the details in a row, and then you go through a, a life cycle design process and, and experience design, which is, okay, based on that, what kind of marketing should I be doing? I know who I am, I know who I want to serve, I know what the numbers need to look like, so what kind of marketing is going to suit that, and what does that lead into the right sales process 
process that is a match for that. So it's just one congruent experience. The experience, like you said, it's not the class. It's not the little, the things that everyone assumes. They're like, oh yeah, we, we do a good job with experience. It's like, oh, we've got consistent classes. And I'm like, that's the minimum. That's you showing up to work on time. Like you actually want to wow someone. You have to architect an experience that aligns with their wants and their needs and their desires for fun, for culture, and for value. At the end of the day, we're in a relationship-centric business and it's a perceived value play top to bottom. If the perceived value does not exceed what you're charging with these other things around like the social events and like, wow, they're sending us content, like, well, I'm going through on-ramp and then they're checking in on me and he's like, that was so cool. Like when you get that effect, now you create that, well, 200 bucks a month, like maybe before I used to think that's expensive, but it's actually a drop in the bucket considering. And now you have a winning formula. People want to know you care. That's what mm-hmm. people want to know you care. And so if they don't show up for a class and they don't hear from anybody, then they know they can get away with something. The reason they give you money in the first place is because that's an admission that I don't know what the fuck I'm doing and I don't want to figure it out. I'm going to give you money and you're going to give me the magic, right? And we have to somehow show them that they're personally responsible, no one but them can hold them accountable, but, but they give us the money thinking that we're going to do all those things. What we have to do is say, I know I can change your life, so I'm going to bring you in where you're at, but on the back side, I'm going to give you what you need, right? And you mentioned something there about like knowing yourself. And I honestly, I think that's if, if before, before you look at any of this, it's the biggest thing, know yourself, right? Because if you know who the fuck you are and what the fuck you want, everything else is fine. I think one of the, one of the hardest things is a lot of people feel like a fraud. Right? They feel like they don't know what they're fucking doing and it's because they're building something that they shouldn't be building because they don't know who they are and they don't know what they want. Misaligned. They're seeing someone else, like you mentioned, three, four gyms and they go, you know, that's what success is. So that's what I'm going to do. They're not looking at fulfillment and they're not looking at, at, at their personality. Not everyone is built to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody is built to be a business owner. Not everyone's built to be an independent coach. You know? And so you gotta figure out, okay, what, what is it that I, I am gonna do and I'm good at? And just like stay in that lane. If you have the vision, like a lot of people, like a lot of people don't have visions, but if you have a vision for something bigger, you, you, you maybe be able to do that, but you're probably not gonna do it on your own, right? Because otherwise you would. And so these are the things where we go back to knowing yourself and figuring out your strengths and weaknesses. Like once you start to go down that path and realize that my business will actually grow if I go on a personal development journey and like improve myself, everything comes in us. And that's the, the, with all of this, we've, we've talked a lot about, if you look at what we've said, it's about your life is your message. Like your clients are your marketing. Your experience is your sales. And I think that that's what most people segment stuff and think it's all separated. And really you've got to understand it's got to come back together. Now you might have to piece it out to meet people with different messages at different points, but you can't be like, okay, my life over here, I drink, I party, I'm out of shape, but I'm going to go over here and I'm going to be preaching health and fitness. And, or, uh, you know, I might have a terrible relationship with my, my family, but I'm going to say I, I'm going to build this amazing community. If you can't have a good relationship with your wife, then you're not going to probably have a good relationship with clients. And so it's all, all six, like together. And I think that the people who really have knocked it out of the ballpark, they're the same person in the gym as they are when you go to dinner, as they are when you go over to the house, as they are when they, you know, when you talk to them on the phone. And that's the difference. It's, it's when you can say, oh wow, like this is all one thing. And I just have to be more of me, boom. Like now, now everything takes care of it. And then of course then we get into the more advanced stuff which we've talked about before with systems and automation and all of that stuff to amplify and scale. But unless you have that foundation, mm-hmm. then it's, it's gonna all come crumbling down. And as Louis says, the pyramid's <laughs> as big as a space. <laughs> yep. exactly. Speaking of Louis, you said something over breakfast that I thought was really, really cool. And we were talking to kind of shift gears here about just like building business and, and how um, you said like the conjugate system about, you know, it's not about saying like, I'm just gonna work on my squat, 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 and like add a hundred pounds over the next 90 days. Um, and how it's about like leveling up and over time, maybe this person has more gains in the short term and they look like they're killing it and they're like, oh my God, they've you know added all these numbers to the board and whatnot, but five years down the road, 10 years down the road, that's not what it is. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on that and, yeah. and share that, what you share with us over breakfast? So it comes down to sustainability and looking at am I building a short term or am I building long term? And if you go hard as bulls, we, we use diet as the example and then I'll tie it in, but. If I I go on a restricted diet, I can lose a lot of weight really, really quick. Can I do that for the next 20 years? The answer is no, 
right? And so you can diet really, really hard, but at some point you're gonna have to figure out how do I eat regularly? Like how do I listen to my body? How do I understand all this stuff? So you can get quick results, but it's usually not sustainable and you usually ebb and flow, right? And that's what most businesses, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. They'll go all in on something and then, you know, out. People do it with training. I'm gonna train my squat really, really hard. The rest of the lifts go down or the conditioning goes down, you know, depending on what sport they're in. And, and really what it's about is if we can take that conjugate approach that Louis has created where it's like, we look at, okay, I don't, I don't do much for sales, I don't do much for marketing, my experience is kind of weak. Instead of saying, I'm just gonna focus on experience, you say I'm gonna do a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, and maybe, I get, maybe I'm getting a couple of leads a week now. And then over the next, you know, if that grew exponentially over the next five years, in five years, not only have you been able to grow at a pace that you can manage with cash flow, but you've got a sustainable business because you've you been able to put stuff in. When you go, okay, I'm a, I'm, I don't have enough members, I'm gonna put $5,000 in advertising, and you hire a guy and they get you 200 leads, and then you gotta figure out, how the, what do I do with these 200 leads? How do I, how many, how can I, how, how can I have a sales conversation with each of these? I mean, it, it, you, you can flood and you can, and I think that that's, the, when you look at the long tail, it's like, what is sustainable over time? Mm -hmm. And working, this is where the hustle and grind argument comes in, but working 20 hours a day is not sustainable. Right. Sometimes it is necessary because you're in a place where you don't have an option. So I don't want to take away from those people that, that do that. But if you're in a place where it's optional, you have to understand, I can't do this. I'm going to burn out. I'm, you know, I'm going to hit stress levels and my adrenals are going to fatigue. It's not a case of being a pussy because you're not working 20 hours a day. It's a case of understanding. If I don't get eight hours of sleep, I can't show up at my highest. Therefore, the business suffers. And that's, I think that most people, when they look at they want everything fast, fast, fast. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've been able to do in my entire life, don't know why, but it's that delayed gratification, saying this is where I'm going and being okay with not being there tomorrow. And you have to remind yourself, but it's like, you know, we're in a beautiful gym, this place is huge. But Zach didn't start here. He didn't start this ma magnitude. He's having to make adjustments. He's learning as he, go, you know, he, go, he goes with certain things. Successful, yes. Where he wants to be, no. But it's having the patience. A lot of guys open in boxes, they'll come to a place like this and say, this is what I'm gonna open. They'll go get massive loans and stuff like that and they just don't, it's not possible, it's not sustainable. They don't have the member base, they don't have the experience. And I think that that's where we see people who have longevity in business, longevity in sports, is they take the less is more approach and they're patient. They're patient. If you try to flood, you try to do everything too soon. In sports, injuries, you know, lifting injuries, you see guys like that all the time. Um, and in business, what you see is you just the, the money goes up, money goes down, you know, and it's a rough place to be. So I think that that's to play on the point we're talking about is just taking that holistic approach for the business. Right, and it, you know, just like you would, like I would imagine anyone listening, they wouldn't go out and say to someone like, you need to be on a 500 calorie a day diet. Right, it's just probably not a healthy thing to recommend. Does it work? Yes. Does it get results? Yes. Is it sustainable? Absolutely not. Yeah. You know, Biggest Loser is the best example of that. Nearly all of them gain the weight back because they can't work out eight hours a day. They just they don't go back into a lifestyle where they do that. Yeah. If you can work out eight hours a day, you, that's that's good. But you, most it, people can't. And it's probably one of the the biggest. Um, lessons we have to teach with the people that we work with when they come in and they say like hey I, I want to start working with you guys I want to add you know I want to double my business in the next six months you know and they've got you know a hundred members or something whatever is that possible is it possible all of it's possible there's all sorts of like tactical things we could glue together and like where we can find the most leverage and get you there is that what I would recommend for you absolutely not because you're gonna get there and you're not gonna be actually able to support that or the systems aren't gonna be in place or certain things may suffer and people have to understand in business that like right coming from you guy mr. two-time world record holder this is a really important lesson it's like look at what you achieved with that mentality yeah. versus what a lot of other people are doing and then you may have been in the gym where someone else you're like fuck man this guy like he just went up by 100 pounds faster than I did and it's hard to fight that and you know watch the guy down the street go from zero to like 250 members in like a year and you're like damn it I'm still at like 150 but knowing that you are building a solid foundation a real business and not a house of cards that as soon as the, the wind picks up you are up shit creek because nothing is actually stable nothing actually is built upon fundamentals and it's not a balanced business right you can be super sales and marketing centric to just like jumpstart things but you have to understand that you have to balance it back out as quickly as you can and that's kind of that startup thing 
that people, I think, as they evolve and the business starts to grow, what it takes to start up is not what you do to then grow. Like when I jump start it, like and you, you know, you're, you're putting the power cables on, on the battery to like just get that first. I'm taking that shit off right away. I don't want to burn everything out. It's the same thing in the business. You're gonna jam up sales, marketing, get get a bunch of hype going, but then immediately transitioning to okay, how do I scale well? That's a great point. I mean, uh, go, when you open the gym, you, when you and Rob open the gym. Could you do what you do now as the person you were when you opened that gym? Absolutely not. So, you know, it, it, it's a, everything has time. You came in at a certain time where you, like this show, the way it is now, none of this would exist if we weren't, if we weren't where we were back then. Mm -hmm. That person that we were could not do what we do today. And I think that's something people have to understand. If I own one gym and I have a vision for a hundred, if I'm doing anything in that one gym, I'm not a person who can run 100 gyms. You know, right. Can you jump from one to 100? Probably not. There's so much you have to learn and there's a time, there's a place, and I think that patience is the hardest thing to have as a human. You know, we only have an infinite amount of time, like very da short dash on this planet. We don't know the, be we know the beginning, sorry. But we don't know the end, right? And so we have this ticking clock which creates this impatience. And unfortunately, we can't rush that shit. We don't have control over it. You know, yeah. time was there before us, it's there after us. We can try to control it, but you know, it, it is, yeah, you know, it's gonna do what it wants to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, I feel like this whole show has just been one big overarching reminder that you just, you can't neglect the basics. Like you gotta, you gotta do the basics and the big three categories, you know, sales, marketing, and client experience, or like distribution, whatever your service is. Like if you don't have those things down, there's no reason to do all the other things you're gonna have to do in business. That's all that, all that front facing, customer facing, stuff sales marketing and, and experience like you know nail those down and then there's so many other things after that that you can go take care of but if you don't if you don't do, have those basics there's no reason to do anything well, you know if you if you're putting you uh, if you're turning on a faucet that's you know spitting out water but there's no way for that water to go you know you're gonna you're gonna drown yeah. and I think that that's the biggest thing you know there's people want to run before they can walk and it's it's, it goes in sports as well, you know, you're not going to come in, never train CrossFit and go to the CrossFit Games. You know, there's a process, probably a five-year process to even know if you're, even know if you have the, the ability to do it, right? Um, and of course, there's a few freaks out there that come in and, and within a year, they're, you know, you yep. know, but you, um, the reality is, is that the basics are fun. I feel like Coach K, you know, of Duke, I mean, I was, back when I played basketball, that was one of my favorite teams, but it was, they run the same plays over and over and over again. And it seems to be, you know, that's the most successful is the people who master the basics, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you go back to that when you're struggling. You know? mm -hmm. If you're struggling, and it's like, okay, what are these three areas am I not focused on? Yep. You know, and it's easy to usually see, fuck, right here. And again, if you don't like those words, marketing, sales, you do whatever you want, but it's, you gotta have a conversation, you gotta convert, and then you gotta deliver. Like it's, yep. that's the, the, the three phases. Those three things are what gets you members, and then keeping the members is, you know, the, the, the it's, if you're just focused on the front and they're, le they're leaving at the back, well, you gotta fix that leaky bucket. But I mean, you're right, it's, it's the fundamentals. Without the fundamentals, you can't build a, you can't build a solid house, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good summary. I think that was a really, it was a really good reminder too, around the, those three principles like you can you spend all this time like without those three it's not going to be in alignment but to remember it always does come back to you and being in alignment with yourself and saying okay like who am I what is it that I actually want out of this what do I want my day-to-day -day look like what are my goals what is my I'm doing the perfect day exercises and things like that is so valuable in defining what all those what's going to happen in those three because you can't really do those honestly and get phenomenal results without being in in line with where you are personally and what you really want out of this thing. Yeah, and all these things are all tied together. It's one big system, like you were saying, and I, I think that's the biggest takeaway for me. Um, thanks for joining us today. Where can people find more about you? Just go to ajroberts.com. ajroberts.com. Yeah, if you enjoyed listening to this show, watching this show, make sure to subscribe on YouTube, go to iTunes, five-star review, positive comment. See you next time. <laughs>